Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to the Santa Barbara Botanic Gardens 11th Annual Conservation Symposium. And thank you so much to our major sponsors, the Nakashima Rani family. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Truly, their, their support is just really game changing, so thank you. So the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, our mission is to conserve California's native plants for the health and well-being of people and the planet. And that might seem like kind of a big leap from native plants to the health of the planet, but let me break it down. It's native plants that have evolved in a place with the climate, with the soil, with the bugs and the birds, and they're better at supporting the food web. So they're essentially the foundation of biological diversity and biological diversity does so many things for us from our clean air, clean water, holding our soil in place, breaking down our waste, pollinating our food, that it's really not so much a stretch to say that the health and well being of people and the planet is at stake. So we're proud that at the garden we tackle um, the conservation of California's native plants and habitats comprehensively from the level of genes to the level of ecosystems. And I like to think of the work that we do like the layers of a cake, each one that builds on the layer beneath it. So the first is that we need to understand the nature and evolution of California's plant diversity. We need to know what the plants are, we need to know where they're found, what's common, what's rare, what communities that they form. And we also under need to understand their genetic differences and their genetic diversity. Next, we wanna keep all the parts because every species has a role to play and a niche to fill. And when the tapestry of life unravels, it's kind of a slippery slope. So we aim to protect and recover our region's rarest plants. And the work that we do runs the gamut from surveys to research, from seed banking to recovery actions. Thirdly, it's not enough to just set land aside and hope that it will be okay. A lot of our land has been degraded and it's no longer functioning at its potential and doing the jobs we need it to do. So we need to actively restore our land to a diversity of native plants that can form healthy habitat and support food webs. And lastly, the icing on the cake is talking and working with people to advocate for biological diversity so that we expand our sphere of conservationists. And that's what we're doing here today, so welcome. So let's get on with the show. I'm here to introduce our theme, which is Tiny Taxa Doing Big Things. I hope that we give you your daily dose of awe and wonder today. My name is Denise Knapp, and I'm the Director of Conservation and Research at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. So I'll bet that you all know what this little virus on the screen is, and I don't have to tell you how big its impact has been. Here's another tiny taxon that has had a large impact on human populations. This tiny bacteria, Yastinia pestis, is the cause of the bubonic plague, which killed between 75 and 200 million people in the 1300s. It's spread by another tiny taxon, the oriental rat flea, which in turn gets around via small mammals like rats. But let's talk about lighter topics. Like how amazing some of these tiny creatures are. So since we're talking about fleas, you probably know that they can hop like mad. But did you know that they can catapult themselves about 50 to 80 times their body length in distance? This is comparable to a six-foot human leaping over a 30-story building. I mean, that's amazing. They're also ridiculously fast, being able to complete their takeoff in as little as one millisecond. They're able to propel themselves so high because of a protein called resilien, which is like an elastic pad which expands and contracts when the flea jumps and lands. And this elasticity gives them about 100 times more power than, they were op than if they were operating on muscle alone. Fleas can also be quite entertaining. How many of you have attended a flea circus? For, uh, <laughs> so Erica wins. So only one in the audience has attended a flea circus, but you're in luck, you still could. There's one still in existence in Munich, Germany, I understand. So a popular feat for a flea to perform in these circuses was to pull a tiny chariot. A tiny wheeled vehicle about half a centimeter across was crafted by jewelers and watchmakers, it was so small. 
A piece of extremely thin copper wire was put around the flea's neck, and this was really delicate because it couldn't be too tight or they wouldn't be able to eat, and it couldn't be too loose or they might escape. So this harness was then attached to a tiny chariot, and the flea's super strong legs would allow it to pull the chariot across the ring. So speaking of jumping, how about grasshoppers? Look at these guys' legs. They are just made for jumping. So many grasshoppers, like the desert locust that is shown here, can easily jump the distance of one meter, um, even though they're only a few inches in size. So this is like a human, long jumping the length of a football field. The trick to doing this is in the joint of their back legs, which has a pair of springs that form kind of a catapult. This is a male Taurus scarab beetle, which is part of a group of beetles that feeds on dung, in other words, feces. A recent study rates this beetle as the world's strongest insect. It can pull 1,141 times its own body weight, which is the equivalent of a 150-pound person being able to lift the weight of six double-decker buses. Why does it need all of this strength? To be able to mate with females underneath the feces, of course. Okay, who here has heard of a tardigrade? Ooh, that's pretty good. Okay, I would say that that's the majority, over half. Um, so these tiny creatures are only about half a millimeter long, and they're found across the planet, from the Antarctic to tropical rainforests, from the deep sea to mountaintops. They're among the world's most resilient animals. They can survive extreme temperatures, including well above boiling point, and also including just one degree above absolute zero, which is the coldest possible temperature. They can survive extreme pressures, air deprivation, radiation, dehydration, and starvation. And they are the only animal we know of that can survive prolonged exposure to the vacuum of outer space. This is a weevil. Its super long snout has mouth parts at the very end. You may have encountered them if you left your flour or cornmeal out a little too long. And many weevils are considered pests because of the damage that they do to crops. So what good are they? Well, these plant feeders help to maintain our biological diversity. Many weevil larvae feed only on a single plant species or a few related plant species. So these critters basically help keep these different plants in check and keep them from getting too out of control, dominating at the expense of other organisms. Similarly, these teeny tiny wasps are like nature's policemen for other insects. These little guys are more than just parasites, which basically drain resources from another species. Parasites don't kill their host, but these guys do, so they have their own name. They're called parasitoids. Their larvae feed on a host organism until they ultimately kill it. And they're typically quite specialized to their host, so there's a whole lot of different kinds of these little tiny wasps. They may be even more diverse than beetles, which are notoriously very diverse. This picture shows what are called mycorrhizal fungi. They colonize the roots of many different kinds of plants. And this is a mutualistic relationship. In other words, it benefits both partners. The plant, which can photosynthesize, basically provides the sugars or the lipids, while the fungus supplies the plants with water and minerals like phosphorus that it pulls from the soil. So some fungi like this can help the tree grow three times faster just by being there. Yet as important as they are, at least 90% of fungal species are as yet undiscovered by us, anyway. Recent studies show that mycorrhizal fungi sequester at least temporarily 36% of our current annual CO2 emissions from fossil fuels. You see, that's because about 75% of terrestrial carbon is stored below ground. And mycorrhizal fungi are stationed at a key entry point of carbon into the soil food web right there at the plant's roots. So these fungi can increase resilience to drought and fire since they make more water available to plants and they aid in both plant nutri uh, nutrient uptake and plant growth. There's another important microorganism in the soil, and that's nitrogen-fixing bacteria. More than 90% of all nitrogen fix fixation is thanks to these bacteria. It's because our atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, but it's in a form that's unusable to most living things. Nitrogen is really crucial to our growth and survival because it's in all of our proteins and our DNA. 
nitrogen fixing bacteria take the nitrogen from the air and they fix it into a form that's usable by the plants, like ammonia, by adding hydrogen and oxygen. The plants then take it into their bodies and it enters the rest of the food chain. So all these little things add up. This is a story about the Fender's blue butterfly, which I find really inspiring. This gorgeous sapphire colored creature uh, is only found in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, where as a caterpillar, it only feeds on the Kincaid's lupin. It also relies on that lupin for shelter. The lupin and the butterfly are only found in grassy meadows, which once covered a large part of the valley. But by the year 2000, these meadows were reduced to just one-tenth of 1% 1 of their former extent. And this is due to a combination of development, agriculture, invasive species, and crucially, the displacement of native peoples whose burning was really important to maintain these prairie openings. So after the Fender's blue butterfly was described by, by biologists in 1929, it was presumed extinct for 50 years. But in 1988, it was rediscovered by a 12-year-old boy, and it was added to the endangered species list in the year 2000. Conservationists like Cheryl Schultz, who's now at Washington State University, and the nonprofit Institute for Applied Ecology have been working to conserve the Fender's blue butterfly for decades. Their strategies have involved not just growing and planting a bunch of the lupin that it depends on, but they've also worked to provide those things I was talking about in the soil, the rhizobium bacteria and the mycorrhizal fungi that help to make the lupin successful. They've also been working with <clears throat> local tribes to bring back burning, which keeps the meadows open and increase the vigor of the host lupin, but also the associated plants that provide nectar for the adult butterflies. So the other thing that burning does is, um, is it helps uh, to control the exotic annual grasses, which make it inhospitable to a really important ally of uh, these plants, which uh, of, the, of the caterpillars, I'm sorry, of the, of the butterfly, and that's ants. And that's because the ants eat a sugary substance that is excreted by the larvae. You can see in the lower right photos these sort of bumps. And I can try to point to it, but I think that's complicated. There, you can see. You can see those bumps that I'm pointing to there. In exchange for these sugars, the ants basically stand guard against predators and parasites. Oops. As of 2018, um, these, the butterfly population has quadrupled and it's poised to be downlisted from endangered to threaten because of all of these efforts to restore the whole system, which is what's so cool is that by protecting this endangered butterfly, this whole system is basically restored and rejuvenated. Then there's bees, which contribute more than $15 billion to the U.S. economy by pollinating crops. So, of course, they're vital to food security in the U.S. and beyond. One out of every three bite of food that you take is thanks to bees and butterflies and moths and other insects. There are 1,600 different kinds of bees in California, which is almost impossible to picture. And they're better pollinators than our imported European honeybees. So wrapping up here, I just wanted to say cheers to the humble yeast, which is a fungus for giving us bread and beer. <laughs> and cheers also to Dr. Shirley Tucker, who is our 2024 John C. Pritzloff Conservation Awardee.